Yeah, the first day we got drenched, man. Um, the first day was probably the hardest of the lot, and that was that was going, you know, straight up uh, vertical mud faces and things like that. Um, and it didn't help that I fell in the stream trying to keep Kim f- from falling in in the first five minutes of the walk. Jeez. So, man, I was, you know, I was, I was sludging around the, that all that day in wet boots. It was great. Were you prepared for that? <laughs> Were you wearing, like, your water socks? <laughs> no, I wasn't. I was wearing normal gym socks in my, um, <coughs> in my hiking boots. Do but, they have, like, an equivalent of uh, Boy Scouts? Yeah, yeah, they have um, they have scouts here. Care scouts, they're called. Care is the name of one of our native birds. Um, it's renowned for thieving shit off cars and stuff. You know, it's like a parrot, but uh, they dismantle cars. So that's uh, what the kids is, is do. The care is it the kaka? Um, yeah, that's what the kids do. So it's like a boy scouts. You got girl guides and all that sort of crap here too. Um, sea scouts, all all those sort of things. But um, yeah, man, I was never a scout. But you know, I've grew I've growing up in the bush me and my brothers my cousins you know we spent you know all our youth running around in forests and getting up to shit where you shouldn't have been getting up to it was right. good times man but, I was uh, in Boy Scouts but we got me and my brother got kicked out for I think we got in a fight with two other brothers <laughs> and they they kicked us out it was stupid we had a lot of fun though. my my dad became like one of the one of the leaders so it was like man, we couldn't get away with anything he was always on us so well, we did some cool shit here in California. All our camping trips were here in California. And you could camp every weekend for a lifetime and find a different spot to camp in California. Do you, some pretty cool spots. Do you and Ashley still do a bit of camping? We haven't in a while just because we have the baby. Yeah, uh, yeah. You don't take him out with you? We actually we went camping. Uh, it's kind of camping. I mean, we're, we're on the beach right at the end of the runway at LAX in El Segundo, uh, California. Th- this was a few weeks back, right? Yeah, yeah. Months, whatever yeah. it was. Yeah, that was that was his first camping trip. That was the first we've camped in three years at least. Nice man. Yeah, it I was hope, fun. I hope it becomes a more regular thing for us. Um, you know, we made the um, the decision. Yeah, let's just take because it was a, a public weekend for us, Labor Weekend. So it's a three day, and Kim took the Friday off. So um, uh, Ava and Maya went north to spend time with the grandparents, and we just hit the bush and. Um, Man, I tell you, it was the best time ever. You don't have to go halfway around the world to some foreign location to enjoy the, the time like that. You know? Were the girls fine with that? They did, did they want to go camping? Or they're like, all right, yeah, we're just going to go do our own yeah, thing? Our, our girls love camping and, and that sort of stuff, but um, they're not, not too keen on the exercise part. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of walking, huh? Yeah. Like, I think the first day we covered about 12 kilometers, um, and majority of that cross country. The second day was about seven or eight kilometres, but uh, on the map. But uh, when you're climbing vertical faces, you know it doesn't it doesn't account for movement on the map. Right, right. And that, that day was just hills, mountains, hills, mountains, forests, valleys, and more of the same. Um, so, what, did you walk in a loop, or did you like uh, have yeah, your car parked somewhere? Yeah, we had the loops. We just followed different trails. I mean, the Waitakere ranges are they're riddled with trails. You know, there's there's right. scores of them. Um, and then the you know we've been in Auckland now for uh, almost nine years, and uh, we've you know we've covered a lot, m- and many of them multiple 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 times, but um, there's still a lot more for us to do. But this was a this was definitely um, a big a big three day hike, uh, in different stages. You know, so the the first hike was the more um well, in more civilized areas, uh, a place called Huia out on the out on the in the mouth of the harbour. And that one took us up up into some pretty high ranges and a big broad loop, which we then followed down around and followed dirt trails back to, to campsite. The second day, we um, we travelled to the coast, left the car there, and then just did the big loop through and around, up through the ranges again, but from a different angle along the coastlines. It's, you saw the mouth of the harbour and the sea and all those photos on the Facebook. Yeah. Um, and camped there that night, right in, on, the, uh, on the coast there, a place called Fodapu. And um, day three was the trip from Fodapu to um, Kerry Kerry, which is a, a beach uh, on the map. It's you know it's, it looks like it's kilometres and kilometres away, but um, you know we had a good sleep that night, fed up well before hitting hitting the trail, and uh, we left at seven, and we, we covered the uh, the distance from Fodapu to Kerry Kerry in about three hours and twenty five minutes. So um, you know that, apparently that was pretty good. 
Uh, there was some pretty brutal terrain through there as well, but um, man, going through there was you know very reminiscent of a lot of the scenes you see on, on the Lord of the Rings. You know, there's one one particular spot that I've got to get the photos downloaded from where you're looking down the mountain. It's like that scene where you know Frodo and Sam are, are um, standing on the on the rock peaks, looking down to the dead, dead marshes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like wow. So, um, but this is all territory where. Um, do you know where they were standing when they uh, were looking down there? No, I have no idea. I can't, I've seen the appendices a dozen times, but I can't remember. It's called where. the Emin Muil. Oh, Emin Muil. I knew the place and the location in uh, Lord of the Rings, but uh, we just, the actual yeah. New Zealand location, I don't know, man. Oh, yeah. I've got the, I've got the tourist guidebook here, but um, I should really you know, know my places a bit better. But um, we, we were trekking through a lot of, um, a lot of the, sh- the upcoming Shinara films, oh, not films, they were made for television but you know the, the television series Shinara um, was filmed out in the west out in the, the Waitakere Ranges the core studios are about five minutes down the road um, it's where I spend time working on the sets for them. So you had to drive that every day when you were working there? Yeah, five minutes, that was awesome how long, have you, how long have you guys lived in that house here now? Uh, we've been here in Auckland now nine years Nine years. Yeah, we, we um yeah, we we came back we came back to New Zealand after a stint in the Western Australian desert. Where, um, yeah, right. That house that, that that Kim has pictures of the inside of that house. Where oh, where exactly was oh, that when you were the dive? Yeah, the, was that, that um, when you were mining a mining company? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a. That's a <laughs> um, my brothers and my father are all engineers. You know, tradespeople. They're boiler makers, um, fitter turners, actual engineers, and they've been in the um, marine engineering industry for years. Um, but my, my two brothers, or my the next brother down from me, Leon, um, went over there initially and uh, and got into the sort of resource, the mining industry in Australia, uh, as a as a um, uh, well, he's a qualified steel fabricator, boiler maker they call them. But um, so very, he's welding and shit like that. Yeah, but he's uh, he's on like a super level, uh, very advanced trades uh, tr- tradesman in his field. I think they call it journeyman here in the states. Okay. Um, well, he's got all the. Quite, he was teaching at a, a tertiary level, so um, he really knew his stuff. And he makes um, plate metal armor as his hobby. So, um, but anyway, he went over there and, and established himself. Did very well for himself, uh, working in the mines for years, um, probably close to ten years. Um, and my younger brother went, and um, and the, after a bit of conversation with him, they encouraged me to go over. So. Uh, not being a tradesman myself, I didn't really have a lot to offer uh, the resource industry. So I went and got all my tickets to drive the, you know, the heavy trucks and the loaders mm-hmm. and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I put myself through all those courses while I was here in New Zealand, and went over there and um, and got a job at a place called Laverton in the Crescent Gold Mine. It was the Crescent Gold Mine it was Crescent Gold was in the name of the company I worked for, and there's a place called Laverton, which is a little Aboriginal township about three hours north of um, Kalgoorlie, which is the notorious Australian gold mining central hub where the super pit is and all that sort of stuff. You know, massive gold gold mining sort of area of of, um, of Australia, Western Australian desert. Red sand. Yeah, pretty red. Everywhere's red, mate. As far as you yeah. can see, brutal temperatures, lots of <laughs> hostile <laughs> wildlife, um, a lot of Aboriginals. Uh, they were great people. Um, I've got some stories to sort of share with you behind the scenes with that one later on, Jonathan. Um, but yeah, to cut a long story short, turned up a bit, you know, cocksure of myself, had all these tickets and thought I had a lot to offer. Um, and I uh, was knocked down to earth pretty quick. You know, when I bowled up, I said, well, look, what do you want me to do? You know, I've got all these tickets, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, well, son, you've got all these tickets, but how much, um, how much actual operational experience do you have? And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't even answer it. I said, we, we'll tell you what you're going to be doing. You see that banjo over there? And I'm like, the banjo? And he points at the shovel. He says, you're going to be playing the banjo. <laughs> <laughs> so um, me and a, and, a, and a good friend of mine who came over with me at the time ended up uh, doing the same thing. You know, we both put went through the ticket system together and, you know, went over there with high hopes to, to drive the super loaders and all that sort of stuff in the in the in the mining facilities um, we both ended up playing the banjo um, so I spent six months um, sort of five six days a week 12 hour days on a shovel shoveling, sh- shoveling shit in 40 degree heat it was it was uh, character building to say the least Jonathan um, did, Kim, did Kim work while she was there uh, well I went over initially for three months without 
Kim uh, and the kids. Uh, Ava and Maya and um, Kim came over three months afterwards. Now, Laverton was a population of about... I, I, I can't actually tell you. Honestly, off the top of my head, probably maybe 100 tops. Yeah, it doesn't look like too many people around no, there. And, uh, and accommodation was extremely rare. Um, and of all the accommodation there was, the stuff was, was literally borderline third world. Um, so, so, you know, we end up in this this place where you pay top dollar because even though it's third world you're paying hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars in, in rent uh, because they know you're a resource they know you're a miner they know you're right. making good coin because even though you know even though I was playing the banjo I was still um, you know getting quite a uh, quite well paid for it right. I won't go into the details but um, so yeah we got charged like a wounded bull uh, and in this house we had grass growing up through the um, <laughs> the, sh- the shower the tiles in the shower floor uh, we had all sorts of deadly spiders and shit crawling around the ceiling the neighbors looked dogs, like one wall it looked like one whole wall was a brick wall yeah it was because the house was was originally one house but they put a brick wall through the middle split the two <laughs> so they could charge two two rents uh, so they had another That's family moved to another in mining towns. family next time yeah but um the week before we turned up there before we got this place the neighbor who had two dogs um, the dogs just went batshit crazy one day in the backyard and fell over dead about five minutes later. They just went absolutely bonkers and boom, fall over dead. And they had some, I think it was King Brown, um, killer snake, no, the deadly snake. Oh, shit. Um, slithering around in the, uh, in the backyard. And the dogs obviously annoyed it and it bit back and no more dogs. Um, so it's Australia for you. Yeah, but we didn't learn about this until um, well, a number of weeks after we actually moved in. And, the, and you know, Avery and Myra were playing out in the backyard, and these spindly little wire mesh fences separating the two gardens. And, uh, needless to say, we didn't let them play outside too much after that, mate. But How long did you, you guys live there? Uh, we were there for three months. Because uh, oh. my, my initial contract was six months, and um, after three months, I was like, nah, this, this sucks. Yeah. You know, um, I didn't come here to shovel shit. And basically, as a, a mine operator, we're at the mine I was working at, <coughs> we were responsible for, for keeping the mill operating, uh, the actual gold mill itself. And uh, they use these huge separating cyanide slurry tanks to sort of um, or process the, the gold or the ore. Right. And it, this, this shit was archaic. It was like something other than you know 18th century. And it was right. always bogging. The, the conveyor belts were always getting jammed. So we're in there digging rocks out and and uh, I'm, I'm bogging everything with that was you know clogged with this slurry that was full of cyanide. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't the most pleasant experience. But uh, like I said, very character building, mate. Very. Yeah. Um, so while you were out there shoveling shit, where your brothers <laughs> off doing their jobs, mate, like just living it easy or what? No, no, they weren't living it easy. I mean, I don't think any of the miners live it easy. Uh, yeah. especially the New Zealand ones but um, um, you know they have a, a reputation for being hard workers over there but mate they, their job would have been a lot a lot more desirable than shoveling shit but um, yeah I mean I remember turning up to the to the mine site at 6am because it was 6am to 6pm we used to bust from the um, the camp and and uh, the first jo- job of the day for us as, as the banjo players was to go and unblock all the conveyor belts because uh, they got pl- you know bogged down over over the night shift and everything got clogged up with huge rocks. So there'd be me and my mate uh, Andre who would have to make our trip out into the desert and the, <laughs> the pitch black to go and you know shovel these these big bloody boulders out of this conveyor belt. At night, you're working at night. Crew? Yeah, it was still black. Um, okay. It was still you know was early. early morning, early morning, yeah. freezing, freezing. You know, we'd be working 40 degree temperature during the day and drinking 12 liters of water and not taking a single piss the whole day, right. and uh, you just you you know you'd be drenched. But all the fluid that you were drinking was just you know straight right. out. Um, but it used to be quite um, disconcerting, to, you know, to say the least, going to these these clogged conveyor belts and seeing you know following all the tracks, all the snake tracks, because they were obviously attracted to the warmth during the uh, the evening hours. And mm-hmm. the conveyor belts being warm, you know, it's all sort of diesel fuel operated machinery, and um, and following these snake tracks to the to the belts where you know you're then getting in there, nice and tight little areas and unblocking this shit. So uh, 
Fuck that. Yeah, fuck that, mate. After six months, I was like, you yeah, know, Leon, Paul, my brothers, um, love the lifestyle, like a hole in the head. I'm going back to New Zealand. And so, um, you know, Kim was pretty happy when I made that decision. Living in that town was pretty, um, was pretty insane. Um, you know, uh, the Aboriginal folk were great people, but, you know, come Friday, Saturday night, and uh, the boom industry of the of the township was the local pub. You know, there'd be huge fights out in the streets, and so it's, it is the wild west. That's still. wild as shit, mate. Uh, I became good friends with the local police officer there, uh, David, at the time. He was a top guy, uh, but, but you know, there's only a handful of cops in this this town, and you know, they'd be called away miles and miles and miles away, and nothing was ever, you know, nothing ever felt safe. So um, the concern for me was the safety of my wife and children, especially when you're working 12-hour days out on the, in the mine site. Yeah, I'd be a nervous wreck. Dude. Yeah. I mean, dude, it was one night. It was like a Friday night. And had come home, you know, sort of crash out, had your shower, wash all the red dust and shit off you, settle down and watch a bit of television with, with, with Kim. And I remember it was like about 10 o'clock at night. And uh, I heard the security grill on the front door rattling. And I'm thinking, what the hell's that, man? Um, so the lights were all off apart from the television. I got up, I went to the door just nice and quietly and, uh, you know, opened it real quick and there was this Aboriginal guy there, his drunk stunk of it, you know. He had this huge club, you know, this, this big-ass club with all these nails, these rusty nails sticking out of it. And I startled him. He didn't think anyone was home or something. He said, mate, what do you, what do you want? What are you doing here? And um, he was like, oh, 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 oh. Uh, uh, oh, I just wanted to know if you wanted to buy this. <laughs> no, what the fuck? On the fly, that's the best shit he can come up with. Now, the whole time, I've got door my arm... Door-to-door murder weapon salesman. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, the whole time, I've got my arm up behind the door, and I'm unlatching, the, un, unlatching my, my knife. I had a knife strapped to that door. And, you know, I had it in my hand, and I was ready to pull it out and stick this guy who's going to stick this club over my head, so it'll be who's going to draw first in the Wild West. Oh, and um, anyway, I talked to him and I said, look, I'm, I'm not interested in buying your fucking club. Take it, fuck off, or there's going to be a drama. And Kim's in the, in, the, in the lounge room just thinking, oh my God, oh my God. Luckily the girls were in bed asleep. And uh, anyway, he, he came to his senses and so, you know, saw, the, saw the shining light and decided to mosey on down the road. But um, you, got, you, you were... You have neighbours, or is it kind of out in the middle of nowhere? Are there other yeah, people? had neighbours, but mate, they were all. I didn't know my neighbours. I knew that their dogs got bit by snakes, and that they were as fucking loopy as. Do they treat you know one legged kangaroo? Do they treat kiwis kind of weird there? Um, like, uh, mate, I've got lots of Australian friends. You know, it's real, probably like really, Americans and Canadians. Yeah, there's it's a love hate relationship, mate. Right. I mean, especially at this time of the year, because we're about to flog them in the World Cup, uh, the rugby this weekend. This will be our second World Cup win in a row, and we're up against the Australians. So there's, this, there's definitely a love-hate relationship between the two. But may I, in saying that, some of my best friends are Australians. Uh, they're a top bunch of guys yeah. uh, and girls. And um, the guys I worked with in the mines were, were no different to the Australians that I work with in, in Sydney, in New South Wales, or in, in Queensland. Yeah. Um, you know, the through, through salt of the earth uh, people, mate. You know, they're a hardy bunch. They're hard, they're hard workers. They're a hard bunch. Um, they're, they're a bit different. Um, they breed into the average Kiwi. They don't tolerate any shit. Uh, whereas we tend to sort of, you know, we're a bit more easygoing, I feel. Um, but they're a salt of the earth. You know, through my, through my YouTube channel, I've met a lot of people, you know, like just, I guess, the type of industry that is, and not a, not a lot of them are Americans. And the coolest ones have been Australians and, uh, and New Zealanders, for sure, yeah. dude. And I have a couple of buddies in, uh, in England, too. Yeah, the English are all good, mate. It's just a different type of people. Yeah, than different. Americans. Totally. But, um, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. The uh, Like, for me, this is just my opinion, but Australia is very American central, uh, sort of centric. Um, their, their sort of the society, civilization here, sort of tends to follow the, the American trend. And, and I know that because, you know, I used to work with a lot of Americans as well. And, you know, a lot of my friends are Americans, obviously. Um, whereas New Zealand tends to follow the UK. A bit, a bit more. It just feels that way. I could, yeah, you know, it's I, just I my perception. But um, we t- we tend to follow the English sort of method, way of life, a bit yeah. more than what the Australians do. We tend to follow the American way. 
Um, you know, personally, I prefer the American way of life, but um, it's almost like the the Australians are going for the American South. You know? Yeah. Yeah, but no, the Australians are a top bunch, mate. So are the, I mean, so are the English. Can't say anything bad about the English. Yeah. Uh, especially because we whopped them in the rugby as well. But um, hey, I'm not saying anything there. And yeah, we whopped them in the War of Independence. <laughs> yeah, we won't get into that though, mate. We could be here all night. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's sort of how that. So I don't know how we got onto that topic, mate. I was oh, just looking at how, me we, how long we're living in living in Auckland for. Me and Ashley were looking at the pictures of the house you guys live in. Where it looked like the place that we lived in not too long ago. No, oh, mate, this place was it was unreal, mate. But we had college kids, which could be a lot like Aboriginals, I'm sure. <laughs> Dude, I, I think on some of my old YouTube videos, there there's a few things that happened that I that I caught on tape. It's people like fucking around. I'd always hear. I'd, I'd have my windows open, and I'd hear the stream of piss. All on like the party nights, you know, because they're, they're walking from party to party. Yeah. Every every house is either a sorority or a fraternity, and then us. And they're just pissing in your garden or on your, on your on your right your car's yeah, paintwork. There's it was like the the street where we parked, a sidewalk, a little strip of grass, and then my window. So they would just be walking down the sidewalk, kind of walk in between the bushes and take a piss right by my window, and it was fucked up. <laughs> so I I had a uh, I had a garden hose. It was the second night that we lived there, and I'm taking the trash out, and I open my door, and there's a guy right there in my front yard pissing, and I set the trash bag down, and earlier that night, somebody had thrown up on our oh. sidewalk right in front of the house, so I, I took a, a bucket full of water and splashed the puke off, so I, I was like, this is probably going to be a thing that I deal with, so I, I, I sat the bucket back in the little little spot in the garden, and there was a drippy hose it was letting the it was filling the bucket up, you know. So by the time this guy's pissing in the yard, the bucket's full of water again. So I, I set the trash bag down quietly and grabbed the bucket of water right behind him. And there was two of them. There was two dudes. There was a, a guy kind of further away, but he was wearing a leather jacket. And the guy that was closer to my house had like a wool sweater. And I was like, yeah, I'm going for this guy because a leather jacket would have just splashed off of him. Yeah, but fucking just doused the guy. He's like, are you fucking serious? He, you, you, you're fucking pissing in my garden. Get the exactly fuck out of here. That's exactly what I said. I was like, you're pissing right in front of my house, dude. He, he kind of apologized and walked away. And a lot of it is because they're, they're rich kids. Yeah. They don't, they don't want to fight. They want to get fucked up and, you know, jack each other off or something. None of them were ever concerned with the girls. Yeah. I never saw dudes, like, trying to just hang out. If I was a college student in that town, that's all I would be concerned with is the girls. There's nine girls for every guy holy shit in a, in, a, in a town of sevens eights and nines you know are the they're college girls it's ridiculous man yeah that lack of respect would drive me nuts mate so. yeah it's it's really hard we did it for five years yeah well we, and, came, we moved back home with no we don't have mirrors on our cars because they've been kicked off yeah you know Liv- living in Laverton mate would have been like Living in Mogadishu or something like that, dude. You know, something out of Blackhawk <laughs> Town. Uh, it was pretty crazy, man. It was pretty wild. You know, there weren't people running around with AKs in the in the city streets. Or but it's a, it's a city. different culture. They're, they're different. running around with clubs with rusty nails and shit. But yeah, like, what the, the real scary thing, mate, and uh, it was um, the week that we left. I remember, I remember this vividly. Um, my mate Dave was telling me that, oh, look, it's not a very good week to be in town. And I was like, well, why is that, Dave? Oh, a guy just um, bashed his girlfriend over the head of a brick, and she's dead. And, uh, you know, he's in custody and stuff, but his, her family's coming to get some payback. Oh, I'm like, shit. well, what's payback? And he said, you know, well, you know he, he, the word payback was you know, such, a, such a thing that struck me. They call it Aboriginal payback. You know, if you... Um, if you do a wrong, it's all, all tribal law. If you wrong uh, a person or a family or your know, loved ones, um, they sort of reserve the right to come and open up a can of whop ass on you in a big way. And um, they suspected there was going to be a lot of trouble, and this guy probably wouldn't make it. But you see, you see people walking around with, with limps, and they had all these big scars on their thighs and stuff because um, you know they'd, they'd lance them in the thigh and cripple them. 
Jesus. Um, as a as a form of payback for something, some wrong that they'd done. I don't know what you know, just stole the camel or something. I, who knows? Um, but they they do all sorts of pretty brutal tribal law ish type punishments. Uh, anyway, this particular week, this tribe was coming down to get some payback on this guy who'd bash this uh, his his woman over the head of a brick and killed her. And uh, so yeah, we're standing out in the middle of of the street, all our bags packed the morning that we got out of there. It was about five or six o'clock in the morning. It pitched black, but um, even just a couple of houses up, there was a huge domestic incident going on, and probably five or six people, big punch-up, women screaming, kids screaming. I'm, I'm, man, I'm not going to miss this place at all. It's, it just reminds me of my, my years in the police. And, um, you know, it's kind of had, a, had enough of can, that. Aboriginals can function. That's kind of like street gangs, kind of like the, you know. Yeah. It's, Violent, it's pretty scary. It's pretty scary shit. Yeah. Uh, especially when I'm one up and I've got my family to look after. So. Um, yeah, if you're by yourself, it'd be a, it'd be kind of adventurous. You might have a yeah. good time, there, but yeah. you got little girls. Yeah, I'm not gonna take a maybe. risk with, with family, friends, or loved ones, mate. So. No yeah, I couldn't wait to get out. Great experience. Um, shit time. Great experience. Uh, Learned a lot. Build a lot of character. Uh, will I ever revisit that phase of my life? Not. In no. This fucking world will I ever go back to that shithole uh, let alone pick up a shovel and dig shit in some crusty third world gold mine you know, I'd rather go be a merc in Iraq or Afghanistan or something and go back to that sort of shit well, so you moved from there back to New Zealand yeah straight back to Auckland and um, uh, about uh, a few, matter of a few weeks later I was working for Rockstar Oh, that's right. Mm. So, yeah. But, um, dude, it's been like half an hour talking and shit about this stuff when we're meant to be talking about sculpting putty, man. Uh, about is, is it. It, isn't that what we're having this this episode? What's that? <laughs> Are we, uh, isn't this episode we're doing about sculpting materials and. The putty, putty talk? Yeah, is it? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. <laughs>